Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here, or you've been sitting in the back row, please show some love to that subscribe button and set your notifications to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. But that being said, Back to Ashes is now shifting over to a new formula to make sure that everyone on the channel is happy, which basically means every video that is not a true Ouija board story, as these will have strictly Ouija board stories, will be in a huge compilation video from now on. Videos will probably remain between the two to three hour mark, just depending. Oh, and before I forget, this will be the last Ouija board video until next month, in which there will only be two, maybe three of the Ouija board stories. Cool? All right. It is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right after the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Also, there may be strong adult language. Listing discretion is advised. I've had two experiences with Ouija. The first can be corroborated by four other people. The second, well, I could have just been hallucinating. The first story takes place during my freshman year in college. I get in bed when I hear my roommate say, Uh, look at the ceiling. Six green glowing handprints are staggered across the ceiling, like someone crawled over the ceiling. They were huge handprints, too. We run out of the room and get our neighbors. We tell them we think we're being haunted and are completely called out as trying to trick them. We hit the lights and show them the handprints. I go to turn the light back on once we're done observing, and three more handprints are now on the wall. They're continuing the crawl towards the light switch. We're freaked out at this point and grab wet cloth to remove the handprints. And the washing seems to work. They're gone. Once we're done with the wiping down of the ceiling and walls, we discuss how weird it was, then decided to see if the handprints are still gone. We hit the lights again, and now all nine handprints are back, plus six more that now appeared on the ceiling above the bunk bed two of my friends were sitting on. We couldn't get the handprints to go away that night. We fell asleep in the room with the handprints. I slept soundly through the night, which I also consider pretty odd considering the circumstances. The second story. I'm 22 years old and at home on winter break from college. I wake up in the middle of the night and see that someone is in my room. My eyes are adjusting to the darkness so I can make out that it was a woman. I assume it's my mom and ask her what she's doing. I get no response. Now I start getting very worried. I ask again. No response. My eyes keep adjusting to the darkness. It's a woman in a white nightgown standing three to four feet from my bed. I keep looking at the figure. Now I notice that it's a girl, maybe 14 years of age, just standing there. I noticed her eyes are fixated on me as she's slowly rotating to her left and her head is cocked on her shoulder. Then I realized it's as if she's hanging from the ceiling and staring at me as she's slowly rotating. Yes, I know this sounds crazy and I was well aware of that at the time. I told myself this is a waking dream and it's not happening at all. I made myself stay there and stare back at her knowing it would go away. I could do this for only about five more seconds, probably a lot less than reality, seems like more, before I busted into my parents' room in my boxers at three in the morning, screaming about ghosts. That's right, 
a 22 year old wearing nothing but his boxers screaming to his parents that there are ghosts in his room. Of course, nothing was there once we went back to the room. This was most likely a waking dream, but man, I was staring at that figure for a long time, telling myself it was all in my head. That figure still stayed there until I could take it no more. That's the last time that I and my friends ever played with a Ouija board. This is a story from my life that I've told to others, especially teenagers, to warn them to never use the Ouija board. It's long, but I hope it serves that purpose here. When I was a senior in high school in 1989, my brother came home from college on spring break and told stories about him and some friends using the Ouija board. It had done some things to freak them out, so we dug out the one we had in our attic. I don't know why we had it or where we got it from. He showed me what they had done, but nothing happened with us. I brought it to a friend's house, and we tried it out a few times over the course of a few evenings. And then, about the third or fourth time, it really started to pick up on its responses. We had been standing by, knocking three times in the corner of the board, and saying something like, Come, spirit, or something to that effect. Anyway, the marker started to really move around the board and spell things out. I always tell people that it was either our subconsciousness or a spirit moving it around because I was certain neither of us were moving it intentionally. With the light touch of a few fingers from each of our hands, it would just move to spell things like its own personality. We would ask it all the usual questions, test questions and curiosity ones. One day, though I wasn't a fan of it, my friend asked the board in which years we would each die. It spelled out something like 2040 or 40 ish for my friend. I actually don't remember the number, just that it was far in the future at the time. And 1990 for me, which was the next year. I asked, does that mean I'm going to die in 1990 and my friend in 20? No, it said. Then I ask again, this time switching the years around between us. Yes, it said. We asked the spirit about itself. It said it died the year my friend's father was born and said its name was Stephen Crane. We kind of laughed at that part. Of course, I looked up some dates around that author after that, but things didn't seem to jive. I thought, could there be another person with that name? And have they moved on? Anyway, we started to invite friends over to watch, who were all entirely skeptical. By the end of the evening, every single one was freaked out. More and more friends would come watch us each night, until we started getting a huge group of people. The board would answer plenty of the test questions wrong, but then, for example, while everyone's reacting to the wrong answer and half paying attention, it spells out, sorry. And another time, for example, in a lull between activity while people are distracted and chatting, it moves slowly to S, then kept circling around to H, 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 until it came to a stop there. Nothing for about two minutes. The entire room of people completely silent. Then, it slowly moved to, okay. It said a bad spirit had passed through the room. Everyone freaks out. I didn't like this one friend, and every time he even entered the room, when we had those gatherings, the marker would twist and move to the opposite side of the board, and other things like that happened. Again, it had its own personality. I remember a few times driving home alone with that thing in the back seat of my car, terrified with my heart pounding. 
One night, I asked it, where will I go to college? It spelled out one of the schools I was applying to, and then 37. I asked if I was going to go to that school and get a 3.7 GPA the first semester, and it said yes. I was sure all along that my friend wasn't moving it intentionally, but I had proof because one day he was really disturbed and frustrated with his girlfriend, a friend of mine. He had suspected she was cheating on him, and he asked the board a question about her while using it with a friend and it told him to turn on the TV. The video for the song, What You Don't Know Might Hurt You, by Exposed, was playing on MTV. I remember he really took that to heart, and it affected his trust in their relationship. So, I always knew he wasn't just playing around with the board, and that was a sort of hard proof of it. We started to actually use the board with our friends, but it only worked when one of us two used it with someone. We asked the spirit why that was, and it responded that the spirit was inside my friend and that I was the owner of the board. Freaky stuff, thinking back on it now, but as an 18-year-old, you think differently. Anyway, the enthusiasm started to peer out after a few months, maybe near the end of the summer, and I don't know what happened to the Ouija board. I did end up going to that college that the board mentioned, but it didn't really catch my attention. When I got home for my first semester, after 1990 had just begun, I got my grades. I got a 3.7. I don't remember if I made the connection or not, but I certainly did when the next thing happened. Around the same week or so, maybe even around the same day, I got the annual catalog that my college sends out with articles and updates and whatnot. I opened it up, and there in front of me was a whole article about Stephen Crane. He had gone to my college for a while, and I never had any idea of it. I remember having chills. Ten years later, I was buying a condo and a lot of serendipitous things going on were happening around the purchase. That event with the Ouija board was so silent with me that I decided to do a good research to find out if a Stephen Crane had lived in the condo I was buying. I didn't find anything, and the condo was great, but if I had found something, I would definitely have pulled out the P and S. Finally, the sad part is that later in 1990, after returning to college classes after Thanksgiving break, my friend, one of my best friends, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart problem. I don't know when I made the connection with the board because by then it was over a year later, but at some point I did, and when I started to put the whole storyline together, it sank in more how creepy and dark the entire thing is. I'm happy in life, very blessed, I did go through a form of spiritual growth some years ago where the darkness was left behind. And the story of my past doesn't haunt me. I share it in the hope it's helpful for others, but I would never touch a Ouija board again and would strongly advise against anyone using one. To this day, I am still positive that it was not our continuous action at work, but either our subconsciousness or truly a spirit. So, whichever of those you might believe it is, nothing good comes from playing around with either of them. At the minimum, negligence can open up a path for psychological and emotional problems, and at worst, relating with a spirit can let in a darkness and fear beyond your understanding or strength that can tent your life and affect you for times to come. A quick edit. After reflecting on my story, I wanted to add some more context for the reason for posting and choice of title. I mentioned a few times that I thought the source of the board's movement was either subconsciousness or spiritual slash paranormal. As a person of religious faith with a science and engineering background, 
I still do think that it was one or the other, or a mixture of both. I have a great respect for both the human sciences and human spiritual wisdom, and both of these have always had guidance in the form of professional individuals and or community experience. For a reason, psychology and spirituality can be very deep and heavy, so they can be quite dangerous and harmful if practiced without experience guidance. The problem with the Ouija board is that it is mass produced and marketed as an innocent game for kids age eight and up, which is not only an insult to both science professionals and human wisdom traditions, but also creates the dangerous situations of people playing with their psyche when they are not equipped to process the consequences. Under the branding of innocent game, Ouija boards make it into the homes and hands of unprepared, unguided people, causing psychological and spiritual damage. I think it's reckless and negligent on the part of the manufacturers, so I don't so much blame the Ouija board as I do them. So, I hope my story presents one example in all of that context, and that is why I say do not use it. Hello. Has anyone ever had experience with something that is trapped inside the Ouija board? I wouldn't say it's necessarily evil, but it's something that enjoys scaring you and making it known it's there. If you are interested in these kinds of stuff, you won't regret it. English isn't my first language, but I think you will get the point of what I'm talking about anyways. I've used this kind of tool since I was 12 years old. I don't play often. I don't ask about death, and I'm very careful to follow the rules. And I'm also careful as to whom I invite to use the Ouija board with me as I don't want anyone making jokes or saying anything that might anger the spirits or such. I borrowed my friend's Ouija board a while back, and we played a few times without problem. A few months later, I played with it with my boyfriend and another friend, and I had a feeling that something else was talking to us. It made jokes and used words like LOL and Ha Ha, like everything is funny, and it says things that makes no sense. And when it said its name, it made no sense at all. And I repeated it out loud as if to correct it. And I got a ha ha as an answer. I don't exactly remember the name, but after the session, I called my friend who's the owner of the board because I remember her telling me something weird happened to her and her friends once. Let me add that I have cleansed this board three times with white sage, another time with crystals and salt, and a third time with all of the things above. I asked her about it, and she described a script or something similar to the one I talked to. It used a different name, not exactly the same. She came over the same night, and I made the decision to cover our faces with protecting runes because I had a feeling this thing wanted to more than just talk. During our session, it asked us to let it out. It said it wanted to play with us here, and we said politely that we would think about it. We don't want to anger it, but I think we did by not saying yes. After that, it tried to throw us off the board I have never felt such coldness around my hands or felt such force as we were spinning around in circles. I was not really scared. I just felt a discomfort, and I put all of my feelings aside as to not feed it to this thing. I wouldn't say it's a spirit. I think it's a kind of trickster. We struggled to say goodbye to this being, as it didn't want to let us go. But after trying to end the session, for the third time, we managed to properly end that session. After the session, it laid in its original packaging, and I had no disturbance in my apartment 
whatsoever. Eight months later, and the board was borrowed by a friend of ours, and I told her that they might want to cleanse it before use, and I told them that I suspect something is stuck inside the board and that they need to be super careful. Our friend called me and said that they cleansed the board in the sun, by my suggestion, and when they were going to start a session, before they could even put their fingers down, the board started to crack in one corner, only in the color, so not through the wood, which is a good thing, I guess. They said some weird energy was coming through where two of them felt dizzy and got a headache and had to lay down, and they couldn't really get a clear answer, so they had to end the session. The last time someone used that board was two to three weeks ago. It's at my friend's apartment, and let me tell you, the things that has happened there. It started with hearing steps in her hallway, but there was nothing there. And then the Wi-Fi got cut off randomly, but she didn't think much of it. Then the TV starts changing channels randomly, and her lights started blinking rapidly. She actually called me yesterday when the lamps were blinking like Christmas bulbs in her home. Things on the table were being pushed down onto the floor. She can't sleep with her bedroom door open since she has seen a shadow standing there watching her. And the most creepiest thing of all, according to me, is that she has an old music box that she's had since she was a little child. If you pull the string on it, music is meant to play. The only thing is that it hasn't worked in 10 years, and all of a sudden, she can hear it playing in the bottom of a box in her home. Not just one time, but three times it played. I send a picture to a friend of mine who can sense things, spirits and such, by just looking and sensing, and I didn't give her any information, but she described exactly what happened in that apartment and described a shadow figure standing in the doorway staring at her. The shadow figure had a crooked back, and she usually is able to see hair color and such, if she can concentrate, but she could just see a shadow of a person. How do we correctly get rid of the board? I have read multiple ways of getting rid of this thing, but I wonder if anyone's had a similar experience, and what did you do to stop the haunting? I don't think this thing is necessarily evil, but... It's not something good, either. To burn the board is a no-no. Where do I put the board away safely so that it doesn't bother us anymore? Sorry for the long text, but I had to describe it as good as I possibly could. I had just come home from my first summer of my freshman year of college. My parents were in the process of their divorce and both decided to vacate the house and leave me alone. I was angry, confused, and I felt abandoned by my own parents and refused to talk to either one of them. I hated being in the house alone. I never liked being there alone, even when my parents were still together. Eventually, the foreclosure note appeared on the front door. My parents gave up on the house, and I felt like they gave up on me. With the short notice, I knew I wasn't going to have the money, so I decided on getting an apartment with my friends. There was about a two to three week waiting list, so we just stayed in the house leading up to moving into the apartment. They knew about some of the experiences in the house and had witnessed many things just for the very short amount of time they stayed there with me. Do not ever play with Ouija boards. That's what everyone else always says. We didn't have the real thing, so we made one from a piece of cardboard and a little whiskey glass as the planchette. This was all a joke to them. They were just asking random questions, getting random responses. Nothing too scary or serious. They were laughing and making fun of the entire situation. I felt uneasy the entire time. I knew what the house was capable of, and 
for some odd reason, I knew it was holding back. They got bored easy and eventually stopped playing. I was somewhat relieved. We were sitting around in the kitchen when we heard scraping on something coming from the living room. When we went to investigate, we saw the glass moving around the board by itself fairly fast. It was landing on different letters, but in a weird repetitive way. I can still hear the sound in my head. This was clearly terrifying and wasn't what or who we were previously making contact with. We grabbed a piece of paper and spelled out the words it was making. There are seven. At this point, most people would walk away, but we were all too intrigued. The house was starting to show its true nature. We positioned ourselves around the board and placed our finger on the glass. I asked, who or what is the seven? It spelled B-A-D, and then spelled D-E-M-O-N-S. I then asked who we were speaking to, and it spelled G-A-R-Y. My friends did not know this at the time, but I knew a Gary. I also knew that when he passed away, that he had requested his ashes be spread out into the woods because he had always loved to hunt and hike in them. This was done in a small private ceremony, and the only thing marking where it was done was a small concrete deer statue placed by a tree deep into the woods. My emotions were all over the place, and in that moment, I really felt as if Gary was speaking to us. The energy was insane, but there was a calmness in that moment. I had tears beginning to form when I asked Gary several more questions. In the course of these questions, we were able to determine that seven demons inhabited the land, inside the house, and on the porch. We also learned that there was bad and good spirits, that the bad trumped the good in numbers, but the good were stronger and kept me safe throughout my life. During this time, the board kind of switched gears, and we also made contact with a man named Hishman. He only gave his last name. Hishman was a popular name in our town, and several Hishmans actually lived in the area. He had said he died in a car accident and gave us the cemetery, which was in the town that he was buried in. He was apparently one of the good spirits that helped keep the bad spirits away. I was in disbelief and very intrigued. I was getting answers that I had been searching for since I was a child. However, one of my friends wanted more. He so desperately wanted to speak with the bad spirits and began taunting whatever or whoever was there. I urged him not to because I knew what the house was capable of. I even took my fingers off the glass because I didn't want my energy to mingle with whatever he was trying to contact. He told Gary and Hishman goodbye and said he wanted to talk to one of the bad spirits. Clearly not the smartest guy. He kept demanding a name with no response. Even after everything he had just witnessed. He wanted more proof. He had a cigarette and dared one of the spirits to roll it off the board. If the spirit did this, he would give them the lighter to smoke it. Again, just taunting the house to show him more proof. But it happened. Not only did the cigarette roll off the board and onto the carpet, it rolled right back onto the board. This means it had to roll up over the lump separating the board from the carpet. We all immediately jumped back. Everyone's finger came off the glass and the energy in the house became thick. The house was alive. The lights began to flicker. The sinks began to spit water full blast. The ceiling fan cords began to swing in circles. We could hear something stomping around on the porch. Whispers were coming from every corner of the house and the basement. Doors started to slam, and the famous shadow figures from the catwalk and the basement were back. 
no matter how many times we apologized, it would not stop. My house had five doors, one on each side and one leading out from the basement. We ran to the front door and it wouldn't open. Something was holding it closed. The only other door we were able to get out of was one of the side doors, but it slammed behind us, nearly knocking my friend to the ground. Once we were outside, we could hear something running up on us on the porch. We all dove off the side stairs and into the grass. Whatever was on the porch kept running beside us while we were running for our car in the grass. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. When we jumped in the car and started up the driveway, something hit the back window so hard that I could see a hand imprint on the glass. We stayed at a friend's house that night, but I don't think either one of us actually slept. The events of that night were truly traumatizing. Reliving now, my heart is pumping so hard because I remember feeling it all. We had to go back to the house eventually, and it was a day we all dreaded. The doors were locked. We didn't lock them, but the inside was totally trashed. There was stuff everywhere. However, the Ouija board didn't look like it had ever moved. It was in the spot we had left it with a single cigarette laying in the middle of the board. The only thing that was different is the whiskey glass appeared to be on top of the number seven. We quickly grabbed all of our essential items that we needed for the apartment and left the bigger items for later. I would like to say that we never experienced anything again, but we were all convinced there was a lot of residual activity. The apartment we moved into was a somewhat new complex and then would just be a lot of odd things that would happen. I first started experiencing sleep paralysis around that time and I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night to a dark figure standing in my doorway. From that point on, I never felt alone. I have never gone back to the house after I moved my stuff out. I know it foreclosed, and I believe it was sold during an auction. I have no idea who the new occupants are. They were apparently not from the area. However, I still feel such a strong connection to the house. When I visit my hometown, I feel a strong urge to go to it, just to drive past it, but I never do. It haunts my dreams often, and I'm constantly reminded of it and of the spirits associated with it. Hey everybody, this story is long and requires a ton of context, but be patient because it's worth it. I've been through some traumatic situations over the last two years, but frankly, I'm starting to forget some older experiences from new ones piling on top. Chronologically, this is like my eighth or ninth paranormal supernatural experience, and it stands as one of the scariest. For the skeptical, I swear before God and all that is good that this is all true. The story takes place in a cabin in Vermont. One room, 16 by 16, lofted area for bed, wood stove for heat, no running water. Attachment with a composting toilet pretty far away, nestled into a mountainside on a dirt road off a dirt road, both forming long trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together because in lieu of rent, we could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and wild settings, and I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man, initials DC, in the mid-70s. DC suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another cabin on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't pay the rent and would not move out, and that upset him. While they were gone, 
he burned their home, which he owned, to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two four by eight rooms with a seven foot ceiling, adjacent to the rubble and moved in. I assumed that was so he could rent out the larger cabin, but no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of this history comes from the landlord who briefly knew DC and a college friend of his who still lives on the mountain in a shack made of plastic and tarps with a propane cooking stove for heat. He is a dear, dear, humble man, and he's a beautiful artist who did not like talking to strangers, but he and I connected over our love of nature and our willingness to get ascetic in the pursuit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property, but the roof is full of holes and it is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is stays up, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see in the moonlight. This story takes place on November 18th. I had checked text messages of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I, we'll just call her Kay, moved in. Kay had some problems and still does. I loved her dearly though, and at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day started normally. She went to work, I stayed home, gave the dog a bath. A steady stopped by looking for her, second time she was out, and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and told her to get in touch without thinking, and that set her off. I had to go to work, so I sent her a message that said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord, a mean old piece of shit of the bad yogi variety, and left my phone in my coat. We were bucking logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work, as the old saying goes. So I tossed my coat to the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting wood, he needed my help to drop off a car of his for repair. He needed my help because he has no friends. And the place we were going to was some rando rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally take a look at my phone, and there's the one message you never, ever want to see. The suicide note. We got back to the mountain, and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting since the day I brought it over because the battery is dead. It has no gas in it because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it and her car. The reliable one is wherever she is and she won't answer text messages. I tried calling her relatives, but no luck. So I mentioned the predicament to the landlord, and he cracks a joke that she's already dead before covering up with a very hollow. It's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas from a gas can, and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving and I was in no mood to be wasting my energy on bullshit. So I set out, jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas. Literally all I had at that point because you don't work for rent if you're flush with cash. And I white knuckled it to town, praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all of our usual spots with no luck and went to the bar where her sister works in hopes of finding her there. She wasn't working, so I gave the bartender my number and asked him to reach out to her, saying it was very urgent. Then I went to Kay's work, babysitting, and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me she had left bitterly swearing that she was going to kill herself but she hadn't done anything because it didn't seem important. I'm going to let that sit for a moment. Then, a glimmer of hope. Her sister had heard from her, 
a single text message of the letter S, but after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing. You can't imagine my relief. So I went home to wait and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell and I was in the cabin alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet, and so I finally sent this poem. Sweet baby girl, out on your own. Who knows the way that will guide you back home? We love you, we miss you, our beating hearts have flown. Out from our chest to seek our missing one. She came home half an hour later, staggered through the door, and fell into my arms, sobbing. She said that she had stopped three times on her way up the mountain because she lacked the strength to return. But she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was, and she said she felt heavy and cold, like she had fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find her way out, and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her, and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me, and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her, through her Ouija board. At this point, I felt thoroughly up against it. Her Ouija board is over 100 years old, one of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice and didn't like it much because my background is the kind of Christianity that strongly believes in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And, depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door to hell. Her board is stored in a closet under the cabin, reachable only by a steep dirt path, tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kay had been down there, she very nearly fell onto a pair of scissors. To put it bluntly, there were bad vibes, and they were strong. So I told her I would deal with it. If... She agreed to follow my orders until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was to climb up to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift to me from a man I met walking my dog, passed down to him from his German grandmother, who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about that crucifix, but that's not for today. I sit her on the couch and hand her the crucifix with the order to hold it in front of her and do not do or say anything. My father is a pastor and my mother is a devout, so I called them. I told my mother what the situation was and she said, You can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success, and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board when I got back, laid my Bible on it to be ready at hand, put on a coat, and looked out the front door. I did not want to go out. I cannot tell you how much I did not want to go out. The board made me very uncomfortable on a good day, now I had to go find it in a closet in the dark, by myself, with the full knowledge that it was trying to kill my girlfriend. I put on the only shitty headlamp we had, mustered my courage, and stepped out. It was dark, there was a slight breeze, and the area felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of working in a heavy wind, but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shoveled down the embankment to the closet, took a deep, deep breath, and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space, and I didn't enjoy that. Fortunately for me, the board was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it that I got from the same man who gave me the crucifix, with the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively Placated. The shawl was super soft and the board said, 
it should be cleaned with silk cloth before use. Fortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped, and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step, and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating fuckery and didn't want to drop the board or any other such negative thing, so I was moving slowly and deliberately. But I put my foot down and had to brace myself to keep from falling over. The second step was the same. I really can't describe it because I didn't really feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over the place. I carefully climbed back up that bankment, went back in, and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped the board and placed my Bible directly upon me and it. I sat down, put my hands flat on the desk, and went for it. I cast out the evil, and I bound the board with the most powerful clear and distinct language I could imagine. Dealing with an evil spirit is like making a wish of a genie, and you really don't want to leave loopholes. As soon as I finished speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kay if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes, and said that she could see the light again, and the feeling of being trapped was gone. Now, there's one last wrinkle I want to leave with you, and I swear to you, it is true. The night before all that happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran out onto a pier to the ocean, through fierce winds and crushing waves to get Kay, and I carried her back as strong winds howled and tried to throw us into the sea. When we made land and looked for shelter, I opened a door and a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and I found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s era, some earlier. I want to say there were 12 or 13, but it was a dream so I can't be exact. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from under his cap and a very haunting look in his eye. I opened the door and pulled us both out of the room, and that's when I woke up. My mom was born in 1950. She went to a college in Rexburg, Idaho. For any who aren't familiar, it's a religious college. She was with some friends one night at a house. There was probably about 15 people there. Nobody was drinking or had drugs. They just had dinner and were hanging out playing games. Somebody brought out a Ouija board. And since this was years and years and years ago, nobody really knew as much about them as we do today. So a lot of people didn't know that they should have stayed away from it. My mom said she didn't participate, but she sat next to them and watched. I have to say, my mom told this story many times, and her details never changed. And she is not one of those people who make things up, so I have no reason to believe this was not 100% true. So, my mom's watching about 8 of the 15 people use the Ouija board. They're asking a lot of questions, and it's getting moved around. But with so many people, she didn't know if somebody was moving it or if it was real. There was a girl that my mom didn't know very well who was there, and she was really getting into the Ouija board. They knew there were certain kinds of questions they probably shouldn't ask, but this girl started asking really specific ones. They started out pretty innocent, as innocent as a Ouija board can be. And then, the girls started asking questions about demons and wanting to see dead people and know the future. There was a bunch of religious people, so they were starting to get really freaked out. 
and wanted to stop. The girl did not want to stop and ask a couple of other questions, which at this point, I can't recall what they were, but she refused to stop. They finally all convinced her they needed to, right before they were able to say goodbye. She didn't ask a question. She said, and this is the part I won't ever forget, I want to see you. Before they could say goodbye, the planchette moved to yes. Everybody started losing it. They said goodbye and put the Ouija board away and started playing charades to kind of lighten the mood. While the games were being played, this girl just happened to be sitting closest to the door. My mom said she was sitting on the other side of the room where she was facing the door, so she would be face to face with this girl, but about 10 feet away. Someone knocked on the door, and since nobody else was being expected, they all kind of froze. I think they were still a little freaked out by what had happened, especially the fact that this girl had gone really crazy and asked a bunch of scary questions. So, after about 30 seconds of pausing, this girl gets up and goes to the door. She opens it, and for some reason, the porch light is out. It hadn't been out earlier. My mom said, from where she could see, it looked like there was a dark shadow standing right outside the door on the porch. It was just a shadow to her. There were no facial features. There was no clothing features. It just looked like a black thing in the shape of a person standing there. Only a few people were facing the door, so most people had their back to it and didn't see what happened. Next thing my mom knows, this girl falls to the ground and passes out. Everybody's focused on her, and nobody had noticed that the shadow had disappeared. They called an ambulance, but the girl didn't make it. She had a heart attack. At least that's what they were told. They were given information that the girl's heart just stopped. My mom never had any other experiences or saw anybody else play with them. I have also never touched a Ouija board. I don't believe for a second anything good can come from one. The demon speaking through it may seem kind and nice because they want you off your guard. Their end goal is to possess you. Some can do it quickly, others it takes time to wear you down. But just by playing the game, you're allowing them to speak through you and you open up yourself to them. The moral of the story? Don't ever play with the Ouija board, and if someone pulls one out, leave the house. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go on, I would like to give a very special thank you and shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugar Spite, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mee, Cindy, Anita V, Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Tommy Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Please remember, without your support and the audience, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and be safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.